All right. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Once again, I'm Mark Irwell. I work for the SMA, and I'm here to do a little bit of uh, a little more exploration on a few topics in calibration. Um, this is a little more freeform than my talk yesterday, so uh, it probably won't take up the whole time, but I'm hoping that there will be lots of questions. Um, <laughs> basically, I'm going to cover three major topics here. Um, some of the people have been asking questions about this, so this is probably timely. Basically, a few a few um, thoughts on what what you should think about when you're choosing calibrators and how do you use calibrators. Um, the concept of phase self-calibration um, and self-calibration in general uh, and why it can be a good thing and why it might be not what you want to do. And finally, flex calibration, since uh, I like solar system objects, we had to spend a little time on that. Uh, first up will be gain calibration topics. Um, and so what are the properties of a good phase calibrator? Well, we like to calibrate with things that we know what the response of the interferometer will be. And the simplest thing is a very bright point source because as you've seen all, all of yesterday, uh, it makes everything easy. The phase that you measure is just the phase of all the instrumental stuff you want to get rid of. Um, so if you can remove that phase and scale with the amplitude, you have corrected your data under certain conditions. Um, so it's got to be bright, it's got to be point-like. Here's 3C279 over here from SMA data. I think this data was just a couple weeks ago. Um, uh, it, ha it should be close to your target. We'll talk a little bit about what close means. Um, and something that usually isn't a big deal is low variability. These quasars have, uh, blazars in particular, have can have very large variability over time scales of typically months to years, um, factors of several to even 10. Um, if that was happening during an observation, that would be something that you would want to know. Otherwise, that would affect your gain calibration, particularly in amplitude. Um, but in general, for most of the sources, that's not an issue. Um, OK, so when we talk about bright, what, what does bright mean? OK, so this is, um, I didn't grow up the equation because it's ugly. Um, but uh, if you look in uh, Thompson, Moran, Swenson, uh, you'll see these figures. And these are basically, what is the probability that you measure an amplitude Z um, depending on the signal to noise of the, the intrinsic signal to noise of the signal? So if you had a signal to noise of five, then the probability distribution looks very Gaussian or right around five with you know, standard deviation that you would expect um, for sigma equals five. Um, as you get to lower signal to noise, you get a distribution which looks less and less Gaussian, more and more uh, Rayleigh, I guess. Um, for that's for amplitude. For phase, it's a little more evenly distributed. It's sort of like Gaussian all of the time. Uh, it turns out that phase is quite a bit more important than amplitude. If you had to choose, you really want to get good phase calibration first, and amplitude as, if you can get it. Um, because phase will be much more important for making images and understanding your data because phase is essentially taking any amplitude you have and moving it around on the map and you want to move it where it should be. Uh, so what's interesting is that the, you know, the sigma that you see here uh, for as long as you're at very, pretty high signal to noise in a Gaussian noise situation like you're being dominated by the thermal noise of the receiving system. Uh, the width of uh, the probability for both amplitude and phase is essentially one over the single to noise ratio. So the higher signal noise ratio, the better you will determine these values. Okay, so we'd like to have some, some signal to noise when we observe our calibrator. We would like that calibrator observation to not take all night because then we would never observe our, our target. So let's pick uh, 60 seconds, you know, just because that's sort of a, you know, one minute. We're going to spend one minute on this calibrator and then we're going to go off to our target and eventually we're going to come back. So what sort of strength of a calibrator do I need to detect it in, in 60 seconds? Well, current IF bandwidth of eight gigahertz uh, on a single baseline, uh, aperture efficiency of the SMA is 
should be around 75% give or take these are we're ballparking things because we, we just need to know a number that we can shoot for in our calibrator search um, the area of the antenna um, a system temperature of 300 kelvin single sideband is somewhat high but you know we're just we don't know what the weather's going to be when we take our observations we want to make sure that we're getting a conservative number so you throw all of this into the radiometer noise equation and the rms you would expect based solely on the the system temperature, so the thermal noise of the system, is 41 millijoules. That's one sigma. So, yes, sir. This is for 230 gigahertz observation. Uh, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> well, it's it's appropriate for not great weather at 230, but you know it could be decent weather at 345. <laughs> um, the aperture efficiency might might have some small frequency dependence. It's not too bad for these two bands for the SMA. We have other efficiencies that vary much more, unfortunately. Uh, and again, we're just ballparking. But yeah, you might want to tune it given if you know, you're requesting, I'm not even going to do this observation unless we have one millimeter of water vapor or less, then you might want to adjust your value because you're not going to be observing your calibrator at a different time in worse weather. So <clears throat> we've sort of decided we want high single to noise, but you know, Let's say we think 10 is appropriate. It depends on your science. It depends on how, uh, how good you want your phase calibration transfer to be. Uh, it may also depend a little bit on what array we're in because the longer baselines tend to have more decorrelation on very short time scales and the signal to noise that you get for a calibrator, even if it's, on, if it's not resolved, will be a little bit lower as you lose some to the decorrelation. But, so if we say 10 is what you want, then that's sort of 400 millijanskis for a calibrator. If you want 20, because you're really interested in astrometry uh, and you wanna have very high signal to noise on your phase measurement, then maybe you want 800 millijanskis. Ballpark. Obviously the higher the better. You can integrate less time if you had a super strong calibrator to get a good measurement of the phase. So, so we're shooting for calibrators that are over a Jansky, perhaps. Um, this is a plot in 2010 of calibrators on the sky from, measured by the SMA generally. And anything that's colored and not black is above a Jansky. So it's a little depressing because, you know, there are big holes in here. <laughs> you know, if your target's in here, hmm, what are you going to do? Luckily, we're increasing our bandwidth. As the bandwidth increases, your continuum sensitivity gets better, so you can go to calibrators that are fainter. And if you can actually get away with that half mil half half a Jansky uh, quasar, um, which are most of the black ones, then you know you have a lot more opportunities to get something. Um, uh, and of course, one thing you have to pay attention is you can't write a script in 2010 and then assume it's going to be perfectly fine in 2020, even if the system hasn't changed because these guys do vary with time. So 2010, 2012, and 2014, and some are going in and some are going out. Typically the strong ones remain strong, but there is no guarantee, much like the stock market. Uh, Lisa is super slow, sorry. Um, what it is a little, oops, let me go back real quick. It is a little sad to see that at the, this is 2018, but the situation has not changed too much in the past two years. We don't have anybody over 10 Janskis right now. And uh, there are times when some of them have flared to 20 Janskis. There was a beautiful time a few years ago in 3C4.3 went almost to 60 Janskis <gasps> at 1.3 millimeters. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, uh, there. So then, so so we sort of have an idea of strength. Stronger is better. Stronger may be farther away from your target. So let's think about how close do you need, really need to be. And again, this is more of a hand wave argument. I think that there are probably ways you could go through some detailed calculations um, to really optimize this. In some cases. But I think 
given that the number of calibrators we have is a relatively small set, you probably won't have a whole lot of options. So you'll want something that's close, and if you have to, maybe something that's further away, and we can sort of hand wave what close means. But there are other things that you need to consider. It's not just the atmospheric phase stability you're trying to get rid of. There are also instrumental effects. Um, and if you have to go 15 degrees away from uh, your target for a calibrator, in a worst case scenario, that will be exactly 15 degrees of RA uh, early or late relative to your, your source. And that means that the source could be, could be rising or setting an hour difference from when your calibrator is rising and setting. So there will be an hour of time at the beginning or the end where you might not have a calibrator available for the, the calibrator you chose. So again, closer is better because you will have that calibrator available for more of the time. Um, and uh, the atmospheric path length differences actually grow quite a bit as you move to lower and lower air mass. Uh, makes sense, you're going, looking through more atmosphere, um, so the turbulence, your path length is also gonna be a lot higher, so you're gonna see higher phase uh, instabilities and the fact that you're looking at different air masses between your target and your calibrator means that those will be exacerbated. Um, so yes, be closer if you can, but as we've already said, you might not have a whole lot of choice. Uh, I think this is sort of anecdotally, but if you have to go to 15 degrees, it will work. Uh, we've gone more than that. Uh, we've gone to 20 to 25 degrees if you need to. Uh, hopefully you don't have to. Um, within five degrees typically is, uh, wow, you picked the right source, <laughs> right close to a calibrator. Um, actually. The best case is if you can actually make your source a calibrator, but we'll get to that in, in the... <laughs> so yes, if you like to observe quasars, we have an array for you. <laughs> All right, uh, one other thing is to think about is, you know, you don't have to use just one calibrator. You can use multiple calibrators, uh, particularly there are a couple corner cases. Um, you have two calibrators that are you know, about the same strength, but they're both pretty far away. Um, so one's going to be up before your source is, um, and then then will rise up, and you can use it. But at the end of the night, it'll sink down below. So if you pick two of them and you, you maybe you know cycle through them in, in in a pattern, you can calibrate over the whole track using both of those calibrators and not lose time on your source. Um, the other thing that's a, or, oh, oh, Mark is on the call. Hi. Uh, I usually don't have two calibrators straight uh, right where you want them. Is sometimes you have to pick a strong calibrator, which you know you can detect quickly and can help you get the, the biggest oh, this is, uh, this, this is the, phase variability oh. out uh, uh, in your gain calibration. And that may be fairly far away. But what you can do is you can pick a weaker source that tends to be closer to your, your target. Um, and maybe observe it every second or third time you go through a loop. So in the first time you use the first calibrator to apply gains and that removes um, hopefully the biggest and most important stuff, but there will probably be residuals. If you have a weaker calibrator, um, but you've removed the biggest variability, you might be able to integrate longer on that or over several different visits to that <coughs> calibrator um, to remove effects that could be maybe not atmospherically rated, but Let's, let's think about the case if the baselines are not as well known as they should be. Having a really close calibrator means that the, the baseline error will be mitigated quite a lot if you, if, because it's so close. Um, so if you, and that has a very simple functional form, so you can fit sort of these broad curves over the whole track to remove baseline errors if you have a source that's very close um, to, your, to your target. <laughs> I think that's the end of that. So I can stop and have any questions right now or I can forge ahead. Yes, sir. Just in practice with Mir, so you would basically save the result of the data set with the strongest calibrator for the phase and then apply that result or use that result to then apply the weaker one? Yeah, so unlike uh, CASA or even apes or something like that, Mir calculates a gain solution and applies it. There is no gain table that's saved or anything like that. So what you could do is um, 
but you can do multiple passes on the calibration. So you could, in this case of uh, having two calibrators, one that's close by but weak and the other one that's strong and far away, is you could do an initial phase calibration using only the far case, apply that, then, the, so you, then what you have is a residual result. And you can look at the close by weaker calibrator, integrated, maybe you've integrated it over two minutes every third cycle or something like that. And you can look at the, the residual that it has and see if there's some bulk long-term trends that you can remove on a second application or a second determination and application to the target source. Thanks. Sure. Okay. Um, what is self-calibration? So it's actually pretty straightforward. It's using the target data to determine your gain solutions um, or residual corrections to the gain solutions, depending on how you go. Um, you get the biggest bang for your buck by doing a phase self-calibration because the atmosphere, again, is the instability of the atmosphere tends to be the biggest factor in affecting the dynamic range and fidelity of your images. Uh, but it can include amplitude as well. And the way this works is it compares itself to a model. But in fact, this isn't exactly the way regular calibration works. It's just that the model of the point source calibrator is so simple. But it doesn't have to be simple. You can use a more complicated model. You could use a, a planet with a disk. And you can calculate the visibility function of that for all of your data points. And you can compare the observations to that and determine gain corrections in exactly the same way. I mean, it's a little more computer intensive, but uh, it's, it's exactly the same. You can have, uh, if you have a very good dirty image that you trust very much, that has a lot of point sources in very particular positions, you could use that dirty image as a starting point, as a model for your self calibration and calculate gain variations as a function of time to better improve that image. Um, what it does take is it takes, you know, relatively high signal to noise on your target. So you're not going to be doing this on very faint high Z galaxies yet. <laughs> um, but if you, you know, you have a source that's pretty strong and it has a pretty well determined structure in the continuum, uh, and you have enough signal to, sing, signal to noise, you can potentially at least do some self calibration. It will depend upon what you're trying to do with the science. Um, one great use of self calibration is not only to make a better continuum image, but because the gains we consider to be mostly achromatic, um, that is that if you make a correction based upon the continuum, that correction will also be applicable to the spectral line data at any channel as long as it's not too far away in frequency space. Um, you can correct your spectral line data by doing a self calibration on your continuum source. Um, and that is usually, that can be very, uh, very important depending on if the structure of your source. Because the continuum of a source is often a lot more straightforward than the line structure. So it's hard to do self-calibration on the line, but you could in fact do it on the continuum and apply to the line and get all the benefits. Uh, oh, here we are. So why do we do this? Well, the ultimate thing is it's gonna give you better gain solutions, either on a finer time scale uh, uh, or because your calibrator is too far away from your source because you know, you're in one of those holes in the map. Uh, the atmosphere, of course, is going to be similar over your calibrator and well, hopefully it's similar over your calibrator and your target, but it's not the same. And they're not observed at exactly the same time, unless again, you're going to be looking at a calibrator as your target. So doing self calibration effectively makes that change for you. It says, well, we are going to use your source as a calibrator uh, and calculate the gains. Um, in some cases, when you're mean, you observe planets and they're super bright. They're going to be brighter than your, your, any potential calibrator. So in fact, you'll get better solutions if you have a good model by using your own data than, versus the calibrator. Okay. So here's an example that I shamelessly stole off the web at about 3.30 in the morning. Um, 
this I this was at a uh, uh, UK Arc Node. Uh, I guess they went to to some place and and gave a little discussion about Alma and stuff. And this is something again. So I hope it's okay. It was just out on the web. It shouldn't be anything. But this is a map of a target L2 pup. I don't even know what that is. Um, and it's a continuum map and you see here's a structure, uh, here's a bright central peak uh, and some structure around it. Uh, this has a signal to noise of 400. Um, I think that really means it's a dynamic range of 400, which is the peak divided by the RMS of the background. Um, it's, it's one measure of image fidelity. It's maybe not the best, but it, it does give you it gives you the extent of the over which your mission might be believable. That that range. Um, after one round of self calibration, where they basically took this image and they said, "Solve for gains, solve for the gains," assuming this model, uh, they ended up with this. So they managed to pull out a lot of this fainter structure and a halo around the source, um, and that's over a ninety second scan length. So they're averaging over 90 seconds. Um, they tip the uh, signal to noise up by, or the dynamic range from 400 to 2000. So a factor of five improvement. Um, they, then they went to an even shorter time scale because they guess they thought they had the signal to noise do it, to do it. And they got even a better result here. They've incre increased the signal to noise by another 20%. Um, and this fine structure in here looks like it's pretty real and you know, totally lost in this original image. Uh, we, I'm not going to actually go into gain amplitude self calibration, um, but they did that also for this and it, it was a marginal improvement, you know, another few percent. Um, but you can see, you know, going from here to here, you'd much rather do your science with this image than this. You're going to see a lot more. Now, the SMA can do it. In so this is some data that I took this past summer uh, of Titan um, at 267 gigahertz in our very extended configuration. So the beam for the SMA is relatively small. It's about 0.5 by 0.3 arc seconds, uh, which means the atmosphere is just going nuts because it's the longest baselines. And this is the, the raw image that one gets after you calibrate with the calibrator, which was not particularly close. It was about 20 degrees away. It happened to be strong but it was 20 degrees away. Uh, and, you know, we get a single or a dynamic range of around 20. Uh, but I know from the estimates of the thermal noise that I expect from this data set, which was around one to two millijanskis, the fact that I got 15 millijanskis in the back means that a lot of the flux that should be here is out in here. Um, luckily, we have a very good model of what Titan should be in the continuum. It's basically a round disk. It has a brightness temperature that we know relatively well. It is, in fact, a flux calibrator as well as a, a nice round source. Uh, if we use that information uh, and do some self-calibration again on a pretty fine time scale, uh, we make this image where everything is just much nicer. And the background image is now uh, a factor of five lower in noise down to three Milijanskis RMS. And all, the peak has gone from 300 to 700 here. We basically got rid of all, grabbed up all the flux that got pushed around by all that phase instability and put it where it belongs. Um, so a factor of over 10 improvement in the dynamic range. So just a few caveats here. Um, when you do self-calibration, you're basically saying, I know the model of this source, and that includes the position. So if you do self-calibration, you are immediately removing the ability to do absolute ast astrometry with that data. You will never do better in the astrometry sense um, than referencing to well-known quasars, um, like we do in normal uh, calibration. Um, you can use your original map to make a measurement of the position and include that position in your model, but we will not get a better position from it. You may get better positions in the map itself of, of parts of the image relative to each other, though. So that's a relative astrometry is not lost. In fact, it's probably improved if your model is good, um, but the absolute astrometry is not good. 
Um, it does require the target strength to be pretty strong. You need to be able to detect it on whatever time scale you're trying to uh, do the calibration over. Typically, the phase fluctuations are, um, you know, on all sorts of time scales from the scan length of 10 seconds or five seconds all the way up to tens of minutes. Um, so if you have a very strong source, you have a better chance of being able to do the self calibration properly. Um, and you don't want to, if you have to keep integrating over longer and longer periods of time to get enough signal to noise to get a good solution for the gains, you will eventually run into the phase fluctuations you're trying to remove decorrelating your signal and you will not benefit from self calibration. Uh, one thing that's uh, maybe not quite so obvious is um, the model has to be either very accurate or you really want a lot of baselines to do this. Um, in this sense, you'll get a much more consistent image if you are using something like ALMA data versus the SMA data um, for a target which you don't know the structure of for self-calibration. Um, and that's because you're, you're asking a lot of, of the model for only eight antennas, we have 28 baselines, so it's a factor of, you know, a little over three between the number of baselines and the number of antennas, and you're trying to solve gains on very short time scales. Um, but again, if the model is really good, if it's just a simple point source, or if it's a, you know, a disk, or, you know, maybe it's a Gaussian structure, and you know exactly what it's going to be like, it can work very effectively. All right. So that's self-calibration, very hand wavy. Um, like much of what I talk about. Uh, any questions on that? Right, move on to the FlexCal in the remaining, thanks to Andrew, 15 minutes of my talk. Okay, um, so absolute flex calibration. Um, here is a picture of one of our favorite uh, absolute flex calibrators, Uranus. Uh, and then this is a map taken with the, made with the SMA and self-cal uh, of, of Uranus. This is actually relatively old. I think this is from 2006. Um, but the SMA has actually been quite important in, in informing what, what sources are very good for absolute flux calibration. Uh, and in particular, um, all of the CASA models and now the MIR models can, well, CASA relies on these models implicitly. The Amir models are in the process of being converted to the default for these, but right now they're, the default is not to use these, but you can, in all of the calibration right now, append each command with a little slash CASA, and you will get the CASA model versus the older Amir model. So we're uh, about to be very consistent with ALMA. Um, so, Solar system objects, at least the big ones, are all pretty much round disks, maybe a little ellipticity, but when you look at them, they look like disks. They're black sky, and then right there, lots of brightness temperature. So the visibility of a uniform disk of radius r is just given by this Bessel function as a function of the distance uh, in the UV plane. Uh, because it's a perfectly round disk, uh, it's a it's symmetric disk. Uh, the structure is azimuthally symmetric, I guess is what it is. Um, doesn't matter which direction you move out from the center, you're going to get the same visibility data at, or same visibility calculation um, as a function of radius. Uh, and as you can see, you know, it's ringing because it has sharp edges and it just bounces along. Um, but it's it's beautiful. The problem with flux calibration is, you know, this is a model. It's a uniformly bright disk. Planets are not uniformly bright disks. They have limb darkening. They have structures. They're elliptical. Um, and there is noise even on a measurement of a bright uh, solar system object. So what's useful for flux calibration is generally if you can pick baselines where you haven't resolved the structure too much. Because the more structure you resolve, the more perfect your model will have to be. Um, and our, our models are just not that perfect yet. Uh, but if you can get inside, this is called the first null, you can get inside this point, in fact, to get up to at least, you know, sort of 0.4 on the visibility curve. Uh, anything above that is usually pretty good, a pretty reliable measurement of the flex density on that baseline. 
not just the total flux, which is over here, but on that baseline. So why is that important? Well, for most of uh, millimeter and radio astronomy in particular, of single dish work, Jupiter and Mars, uh, and to some extent, Saturn were the flux calibrators. However, using the criterion of a, of a 0.4 on the visibility function, uh, you would have to have baseline shorter if you're observing at one millimeter shorter than four meters, which is not possible with our six meter antennas, uh, to, to get an accurate measure of the flux from Jupiter on that curve. For Mars, it's seven when it's at its biggest. It does go down to four, so it's more like Uranus in that case. Um, but even Uranus, Neptune, uh, the Galilean moons, um, they are starting to become too resolved to be used on the longer baselines. Uh, it, these are okay in the compact array, but in extended array, which goes out to 200 meters, um, Titan's okay. Some of the baselines will be okay for Callisto and Neptune and Uranus, and these guys will just not be possible. So, that's why at the SMA we have moved away from these bigger objects to Uranus and Neptune and also Callisto, Ganymede, and my favorite Titan um, because they are almost always going to have at least half of the baselines available to do flux calibration, um, except possibly in very extended, but even then there'll be a few like for Titan. Let's see. So last thing to note about the flux uh, calibrators of the solar system object is many of them have atmospheres and therefore will have spectral features. Um, here's Neptune, which, so this is just going from like, a, I think it's 150 to 450 gigahertz. Uh, and this is the CASA model. And you can see there's these very big dips, which are, you know, 10 to 20% of the uh, brightness temperature. And they're due to carbon, mon carbon monoxide, this two to one in the three to two rotational transitions. Um, these, when I was in graduate student, they didn't know they existed, but people were using 230 gigahertz observations to do flux calibration with Neptune. And so people were getting the wrong answer because they didn't know there was these very, be very deep and also very broad, you know, these are 10, 10 to 20 gigahertz uh, out in the far wings, uh, spectral features. Um, they are included in the CASA model. I'm not exactly sure how exact they are. They're also relatively sharp. So it will, the, the brightness temperature that's appropriate for your particular bandwidth is very, very sensitive to where exactly your bandwidth falls on that curve. So in most cases, we would recommend don't observe when you're too close to these features. If you wanna observe at 267 gigahertz, knock yourself out. 200 gigahertz, not a problem. 230 gigahertz, maybe see if there's another source. Um, and my favorite here is Titan and it has lines. This is a small subset. These are the brightest ones, but there's usually a forest of them in here. Uh, and then these lines are not quite as broad, but they are definitely in emission versus absorption. And they're, they're very big. I mean, the, it's like three or four times the continuum level, depending on which line you're looking at and what spectral resolution. So these are due to CO, HCN, uh, their isotopes, there's methyl cyanide, there's all sorts of stuff in Titan. I still like Titan because this continuum right here is extremely well known due to, I don't know, some foibles about the atmospheric structure of Titan itself. Um, but you do have to be careful when using Titan um, because these lines are there. Again, the CASA model, which I actually developed, it's from the SMA data, I gave them the model, um, has all of this structure in it. Um, and therefore, if you are very careful, you might be able to use bands that come across these lines or parts of the bands that come across these lines to get an accurate flux density. Overall, the absolute flux density of Titan, if you're away from those lines, is probably the best known of any object and it's about 3%. Um, the other objects are maybe 5% um, at best. So what would you do if there is no flux cal calibrator data available? Like this can happen in all sorts of games. Maybe the weather was really bad at the first, for the first half of your track. And the data that you were going to get on Neptune, 
uh, at your appropriately chosen frequency was never taken. But then they could open up because, you know, the, the weather cleared up and they were not iced up and they got going and they started observing your source. But then at the end of the track, there was no source available to do flux conversion. What can you do? Um, the, there are two things you could do that I could come up with. Uh, the first is that you could just simply rely on Artesis calibration. If you've done a really good job of understanding the gains and you have an estimate of the losses that you can't measure because you observed this source three weeks ago and you know what the, what the gains you calculated there, the, the, the losses in efficiency were, you might be able to take, just do this TSIS calibration uh, and apply that with a correction and get pretty close maybe 15 to 30% of what you should get. You'll typically underestimate the flux doing this um, because there will be losses that you don't know about. Uh, a, a different alternative is to be cagey when you make your, your scripts to try and observe <laughs> one or two of the, the, the big four, or there's probably 10 qua quasars that are observed very often. Carter mentioned them. Uh, the 3C84, 3C279, 3C273, 3C454.3. Um, there's a few others um, that are observed a lot. Um, and if you include that uh, at the beginning or the end of your track, even for 10 minutes, five minutes, you might be able to use that in a pinch because it's measured so often that there might be a flux measurement that you can use from a, you know, a couple days before or, or after your observations. Um, there are places to look for this. The first that I would suggest is looking at the SMA database. Um, mm -hmm. Alma has its own calibrator database. All right, and then this is the big four here. So this is 3C84, 3C273, uh, 3C279, and here's almost up at 60, 60 Janskis, 3C454.3. Oh, that was a good day. Um, <laughs> But, you know, right after that, it went down to three. It was pretty terrible. <laughs> I wonder, David, do you think my mood has fluctuated like this? Because <laughs> that was, yeah, it's still not, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, I don't need to go there. But what I'm, what's, what's interesting to note here is that we have a calibrator database that is comprised of, of over 400 sources. Some are observed a lot more than others. Um, but I'm, I'm the person who maintains that, and I'm adding, adding values to that every, day, every year. Um, and there may be a really good measurement of your, your target, or sorry, your calibrator, or a calibrator that was in your track, um, that will give you a high quality flux measurement, even if you weren't able to determine it from your own data. So I would always uh, stop and go and look there. It's also a good place to check your own calibration. Um, there's a lot of cross checks that go into this data. So if you get a result for a calibrator from your own data, you can compare it and see, am I close? I mean, if you feel pretty good about it and it's not the same that I got, go with your value. I'm not infallible, believe it or not. Um, but, but it is a good way to double check your, your work. All right, and that's my second talk. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, if you just go back to that last slide there with the big four. Uh, oh, that's the wrong way. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just wondering in the literature uh, or, or anything, um, are there automated plots that are created that can pay, compare, say, uh, SMA and ALMA uh, and show how those light curves track with one another over time? Well, um, let's see. So Alma actually ingests on a semi-irregular basis the SMA data. So you might be able to find the SMA data in there itself and it might show it as a plot. Uh, there are certainly people who, who look at this. There's a huge literature, a huge research um, effort to try and understand AGN in terms of you know, their intrinsic properties. Uh, and they often will take SMA data that I've produced like here for 3C73 uh, and compare it not just with other millimeter data, but radio, near-infrared, optical, gamma ray, in particular, X-ray, 
there's a lot of this cross correlation of uh, multi wavelength observing of these sources trying to pin down exactly what's going on in them. Uh, I th there are time delays that are associated with different frequencies. Typically, the millimeter observations here are as close as you, the emission is coming from as close to the source uh, as you can get at the long wavelengths. And then there's, there's optical depth effects. That means in the, when you're at, you know, centimeter wavelengths, you're actually looking from further out. And so you get a, you'll get a lag often, um, you know, to brighten in the millimeter. And then, you know, three weeks later, it'll brighten in the radio. Uh, and the millimeter tends to be highly correlated with gamma ray activity as well. Interesting. Often with a, a lag in yeah. gamma ray. Yes. How advisable or inadvisable is it to like rely on, for example, only one gain calibrator or one flux calibrator for a given like you know night night of observing like if, if, your, if your goal is to look at something faint like a high like a high z galaxy and you really want as much time as possible on source like is that common to just kind of hope that you can get good calibrations out of a single i i think it would depend again on how strong the calibrator is and how close it is if if it's you know going to be 15 degrees away i would always put in a they, they call it an ALMA check source. Uh, we have a similar concept, though we don't call it that. We just call it a second calibrator. And you observe it, you know, every other cycle or every third cycle. And that is a, because you know it's a point source, when you get your data and it's calibrated and you look at that check source, it's got the application of the gains from the more distant quasar. You can see how well that has worked. Uh, and it gives you maybe a chance to correct some residuals as well. Um, in terms of things like bandpass and flux calibration, those are typically done before or after your source has, before your source has risen or after your source is set, typically. So the best, uh, best practice is to include a flux calibrator both at the beginning and the end. People who are really interested in flux calibration, like me or, or Cardo, like who really want to make sure we will actually observe the Lex Calibrator during the track as well. I mean, you, the, the script generation itself, the, the, the automatic script or, or the script generator that you go through won't give you all of these options, but you can tweak the script after it has been generated to include observations of, of these other calibrators on a semi-regular basis as well. Um, it does take away time on source. But here's the thing. Bad data can only get you so far. <laughs> Good calibrated data, even if there's less of it, you can always add more calibrated data and, and improve your, your result. Adding bad data, as Cardo pounded yesterday, um, can make things worse and may be unrecoverable if you include it. So it's always better to have good calibration. That being said, if, if you're after a simple detection versus, you know, some very high dynamic range need observation, you could probably, you know, be a little more lax in your, your uh, calibration needs. I think it's break time. <laughs> <laughs> when these people are going like this, it's break time. Thank you. We'll start back up again.